you guys can head out the children's church for those staying in the room we're going to be in malachi chapter 3 finishing out our series malachi 3 and 4 chapter 4 is only six verses using the pew bible page 955 there pray that your advent season has gone well that you've been reflecting upon the peace the hope the love and the joy that we have in christ and i pray that you've heard god's message through god's messenger malachi in this series that you've not just heard what he wanted the original audience to hear but the similarities in the ways that he is calling you to live with him in first place in your life we've looked at how we are to give our first and best to god not our last and leftovers We've seen God's reprimand of those that had religious power, but that were not using it for God's glory. We've seen God's reprimand of those that treated marriage as a trivial thing, to be abandoned formally or informally whenever desired. We've seen that we are called to give sacrificially, prioritizing the Lord, not mandated to do so in today's time and in the New Testament age, but to give out of a heart of gratitude in light of all that God has done and a desire to see him work mightily in others. So here in Malachi chapter 3, verse 13, we're going to pick up on the text, finish out the book. But as we do so, first I want to remind you, I've talked about Malachi, the reason we've walked through Malachi, first and foremost, because Malachi is the last book of the English version of the Old Testament. You make a page, turn a page to the right, you're in Matthew chapter 1, which by the way is what we will do next Sunday morning. Christmas Day, we will gather in here. There is no Sunday school on that day, but we'll gather in here, normal time to service. Probably a little bit briefer of a sermon from me. You are welcome, boys and girls or adults, to bring a Christmas present that you have received or to wear one. Uh, I've heard that there is a contingent that is planning on coming in in some Christmas pajamas. That's appropriate, okay, for your gathering. As we celebrate the Lord, Um, I'm actually going to have a big present on stage that I am going to unwrap over the course of the sermon next Sunday morning. So, if you want to see a giant present unwrapped, some of you even may be aiding me in doing so. Christmas Day, this is the place to be to celebrate Christ. We'll work through Matthew chapter 1, talk about what God has given to us. Also this week, Christmas Eve service. 6 p.m. in here. That is a great time to invite your neighbors, co-workers, friends, people that don't normally come to church. If they never go to church and you know that maybe they even worship another God, it's a good opportunity to say, hey, would you be willing to come to a Christmas Eve service with me at our church? See how we celebrate Christmas. And I promise you, we'll be proclaiming the gospel. I appreciate your prayers as we do so, So working through God's story and the sending of Christ. And I'm going to call upon people, all of you, a little foretaste of Christmas Eve, to be willing to give it all to the God who gave his son for you, who calls us to trade in our trinkets for his eternal treasure in Christ. So that's where we're going Christmas Eve. Look forward to seeing many, many of you and your families here. I know that's an important tradition for many of you. Look forward to seeing you here Christmas Eve. Okay? Let's go into Malachi chapter 3. Your words have been hard against me, says the Lord. But you say, have we really or have we spoken against you? You've said it's vain or pointless, it's empty, futile to serve the God. What is the profit of keeping his charge or of walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the arrogant blessed. Evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them, and a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my treasured possession. And I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. Then once more you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. For behold, the day is coming. 
burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will not leave them, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. We see in this text, these verses, a great contrast between the reward for for the righteous ones that have sought God and the wicked who have denied God. We see the final how from the book of Malachi. Boys and girls in the room, a couple weeks ago I told you there were a number of hows asked in the book of Malachi. How many, anybody remember how many hows are in Malachi? Seven, good. And each one is asked with a terrible attitude. Okay, do not ask your parents questions with this type of attitude, and you should not ask God questions with this type of attitude. It's legitimate to come before God with your questions, but the way that they ask their questions reveals that their heart doesn't really want God or even an answer. They want to prove themselves. It's full of teenage attitude and rebellion. Really, God, we don't actually think so. Prove it, God. You're wrong. We're right. Go ahead make my day, show me how we've actually done this because there are no examples. And God deals with their patient attitude, walks them through all of their bad attitude in their questions. And here he writes to them very similarly as we saw at the end of chapter two, when God says, your words against me, they're not gracious, they're not kind, they're not beneficial, they're harsh, they're wrong. And they're like, God, are you sure? And God says, yes, you've said it's wrong to serve God. You've said that the bad guys win. You've said that God doesn't punish evil. You've said, you've said, you've said, and they've said all of the wrong things. The beginning of chapter 3 addresses this. When God turns to them, he reminds them that he does punish wrong. He reminds them at the beginning of chapter 3 by telling them that they are the ones that wrong, are wrong. And in many cases, it's their religious leaders that first need to turn to God for mercy. Here as we end chapter 3 and begin chapter 4, the same story is being shared. The bad guys seem to win. Things don't always seem to go well for the good guys. The group essentially says, God, you are a liar. Which is strange that as they call God upon a liar, that... The terminology used here, Lord, capital L-O-R-D, okay, remember this is not text speak as in modern day text speak where capital letters are shouting, but ultimately when you see the capitals of L-O-R-D in your Bible, you should be quickly seeing, hey, this is the God, the master who keeps his promises, his covenant, his rules, and who can be counted upon. And they say, that's the God that's a liar. The covenant keeping God. He's the liar, is what they suggest. God is a worthless master, they say. He's mean. Boys and girls, in box number one, I want you to write God, and then give me that not equal sign. Remember, it's like the equals and then one slash through it. Liar. God is not a liar. And you can write mean if you want to also. God is not a liar. God is not mean but they were suggesting it. Their limited perspective and their selfishness had blinded them to God's timeline, but nobody escapes God's just punishment forever. If you're taking notes today in a more traditional manner, not in the coloring sheet way, God's timeline for presence or punishment is not always the same as our desired timeline. If we were being honest, many of us would say we want the bad guys, especially the people that do stuff wrong to us, to get what's coming for them really quickly, immediately. Swift punishment 
for the people that do wrong to us. But if we're the ones that have done wrong, we really want no punishment or deferred punishment with as little punishment as possible. God's timeline for rewards for righteousness and pursuing him and punishment upon the wicked is not always our desired timeline. And they failed to trust in that, and they showed that through their wrong questions and their wrong statements about God not punishing wickedness and God not rewarding the righteous. By the way, for further example of that, you can look at Psalm chapter 1 that contrasts those who are in God's word, not walking in the ways of the wicked, but sitting in God's word, meditating, dwelling on who God is and living for his glory, the reward for those that do that, the punishment for those that do not. Psalm 1 is very similar to this concept here from the end of the book of Malachi. When we get to verse 16, We have a different audience pictured, not the ones saying wrong things. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The first time or two I read through this text, I wasn't paying attention to this. That that language here, I was just thinking those who feared to the Lord, that feared the Lord. They God paid attention to them. They heard, God heard from them. He recorded their names in a book. All was going well with this group, but I I want you to notice a little phrase here that I think is important for how we ought to do church, which is why this can be a struggle and why if you're watching online, I want to encourage you to not do so unless you have to do so. If you're medically or providentially hindered from ever being around other believers, I totally get that. This is a good thing for you to be observing a service. But I want you to notice something here that's hard to do when you're watching online alone. And I'd ask you to invite a family member, a friend, maybe another believer. If you're from our church and you're stuck having to watch from home for a long period of time, let us know. One of our deacons will come by. They'd love to watch a service with you, to sing songs there in your living room, and to celebrate the Lord together. Notice the language here, what they did. They spoke with one another. They were not only individuals trying to live for God. In our culture, especially for introverts like me, this would be a really easy thing to skip. They spoke with one another about God. They didn't just individually resist all of the voices trying to drown out the things of the Lord. They did not individually try to resist the peer pressure and the cultural tide of those denying that living for God is a good thing. They spoke with one another about God. Encouraging one another, challenging one one another. According to Hebrews 10, which we looked at earlier in the fall, we're to put courage into one another, calling each other to follow God, calling each other to forsake sin, calling each other to worship together, not neglecting to show love and kindness. We are to encourage one another. If you're taking notes today, we need to speak to each other about honoring God. Being in a service like this is a good thing. Saying to God, God, this is your word, this is what I will submit to, this is what I will live under, is a good thing. Getting in a Bible study class or a small group discipleship group with others that can also speak to you and encourage you about honoring God is a vital thing as well. So if you worship with us regularly in this service, but you are not in a small group Bible study, let me ask you, for the new year, make it at 9.15. Be in the building. Because you can benefit from one another conversations. And you can benefit others as well. You can bring things to the table for the life of others. Teenagers, you hear a lot of voices. 
telling you the very things that they were hearing in Malachi, that evildoers prosper, that God doesn't punish, that the, the wicked are blessed. You hear that a lot. You need to be a part of a student ministry where you hear God's word and where each other can remind you that you're not alone trying to live for the Lord. It is possible by the power of the Holy Spirit to be an individual walking with Jesus, but it is much harder and it should not be the case, particularly when there are this many other believers in this church with another church meeting here and there and everywhere in our community. You need to gather with other believers if at all possible. Encourage one another to honor God. I'm hopeful that some men next year are going to choose to get together, to hold each other accountable, to love God, to live for him. I don't know what format that looks like. Maybe weekly, maybe every other week, maybe monthly, maybe FaceTime, maybe Zoom, maybe three or four guys just saying, hey, we'll, we'll pray for each other, we'll encourage each other, we'll do so over lunch, we'll do so over before breakfast. I'm hopeful and prayerful that our ladies will grow, continue to grow in Jesus, that our classes and our Bible study groups are going to be marked by teachers teaching as they have and people pushing each other on to honor God. By the way, God honors those that honor him. They were suggesting that he didn't, but if you've been doing our Bible reading plan with us, you may recall something that happens in the book of Esther. Esther is one of my favorite books in the Bible because in it, God is this masterful author of everything that happens, and yet he's never explicitly mentioned. There's something that happens early in the book of Esther where it looks like Mordecai, he reports out that the king was about to be killed, and it looks like he's forgotten, that his good deed, the king survives, and Mordecai's never rewarded. It's like, hey, I did the right thing. Like, I protected the king. Man, can't I have, like, at least a Christmas present? And Mordecai gets forgotten. It's like, just go back to your normal life, Mordecai. You saved the king. Good for you. Several chapters later, as wicked Haman is about to do his wicked thing and request that Mordecai, his arch enemy, and all of the other Jews are executed, at that moment, God brings to the king's attention the actions of Mordecai. And Haman goes, remember, some of you remember this, Haman goes into the king's presence to ask to be honored himself, and we're thinking the king's going to honor him. The king's like, hey, uh, Haman, you're a dude that knows a whole lot about arrogance and pride. How could I honor a guy? Like, you're a guy that thinks about your own honor all the time. How could I honor a guy? He's like, oh, yes, the king wants to honor me. This is good. This is how I should be honored. And the king says, oh, that's a great plan. Now you should parade about Mordecai, your arch enemy, and honor him in that way. God never forgets the good deeds or the wrong deeds of his people, or anybody. Nothing escapes his attention. Boys and girls in box two, I want you to draw a person on a horse because that's what Mordecai got to ride, and I want you to write God rewards because in that story, very similar timeline, by the way, very similar time as they are claiming God doesn't actually reward those that pursue him and do the right thing, they had this story of Esther and Mordecai and Haman and God rewarding, but they had a bad memory. Maybe they hadn't drawn it enough in box two that God rewards those who pursue him. God rewards those who do the right thing. Those that honored God were writ written in a book here. They were remembered by God. By the way, I don't think this is like the book of life from Revelation for those of you curious. I think this is just a record. God is keeping record and I think they were keeping records here. They were keeping records of those that had promised to honor the Lord in their culture and they commit to serving him. When we get into January as a church, it will be time for us to renew our church covenant and our annual agreement that we are going to try to make the most of our time before the Lord. I look forward to us doing that. I look forward to us recording those that are committing to honor the Lord in our culture anew. And again, we do that annually because we recognize how easy it is to slip and to fade away. 
And we recognize how important it is to affirm our desires, to be a part of our church, to pursue God, to love God, to make Christ known amongst the neighborhoods and the nations. It's just a time of us affirming again our desire to walk with the Lord and be known for those things that Scripture calls us to. It's a public time. Just as they gathered and evidently had enough people that knew who was choosing to honor the Lord in a culture that didn't. We see language here in chapter 3, verse 17. They shall be mine the day I make up my treasured possession. Similar to Titus chapter 2, verse 14, that says, God, Christ gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness, to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. God spares those that look to Christ, are purified by Christ, that we might serve him. And though the complaint by the wicked and the unfaithful and unbelieving of their time was that it didn't pay to serve God and do life God's way, God says you'll see the difference eventually. When we get to the beginning of chapter 4, we see the differences in what is received by the wicked and the righteous. The, the word stubble there doesn't mean like, hey, he hadn't shaved in like two or three days. Okay? They were dealing with a farming and an agricultural environment. Some of you may have that background. Many of you do not. So for, for our helpfulness in their day, in their crops, as they would harvest the wheat, wheat grows up fairly tall. There's a big stalk on it. And then just the last couple of inches have the little wheat kernels that get like smashed and stuff done to them until you can make bread. Okay, the rest of the stalk was the stubble. There's no good use for it. Think of it like hay or straw that gets put out in a yard in the spring. Okay, it, it burns and it doesn't even give off much heat, and it doesn't burn for long, okay? God says they're useless. They're going to be burnt up. It's not going to go well. God's going to set a blaze, leaving them nothing. There's nothing good that comes of unrighteousness. He says that's coming for the arrogant and all evildoers, okay? Well, evildoers do deserve punishment. We're very clearly tracking with that. I mean, they do evil, what about the arrogant? That's not what we often think of as those that just deserve God's punishment. Here are the arrogant were the ones defying God with their attitude saying to God, how, really, are you sure, God? We don't think so. They were refusing to place themselves under the authority of what God has said. So also today, it's not just evildoers that are offensive to God, it's also the proud. God tells us in Proverbs and James and 1 Peter that God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. It requires humility to give up on fixing yourself before God, to say to God, God, I'm broken and sinful, and what I deserve is punishment. What I need is a rescuer. I can't fix me. I need you in my place. And that is the message of why God sent Christ, because we can't ever be good enough to make up for our wrong, so we need a substitute in our place. We don't need a helper or a guide to show the way. We need a substitute in our place. Christianity is unique amongst world religions in saying that we're all so broken that we can't just get a little help. We deserve punishment. We can't make it on our own. And it requires humility to say, God, I can't. I give up. I look up. I need a savior, a substitute. That requires humility. And it should be an ongoing posture of humility in Christians that marks us where we say, God, we put ourselves under your word. We seek to humbly walk in your way. God punishes those that arrogantly call good things evil and evil things good. And that's whether they're at the bottom of society or the top of society. Whether in their Malachi's day or whether they are politicians and elected leaders today bowing to cultural pressures from the right or the left to call evil good and good evil. Arguing with God and calling good evil and evil good is a sign of of pride and arrogance. Redefining what God has called good or evil as if God got it wrong is a big deal. That contrast between the righteous and the wicked carries throughout the pages of Scripture. Earlier I referenced Psalm 1. 
over in Revelation 21, near the end of the Bible, we have this contrast. Verse 5, And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new, and write these down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this his heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the fire, lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. In contrast with those that did evil and were arrogant were those that feared God in this text. Now, fear here means respect, reverence. It doesn't mean goosebumps. It doesn't mean like the reaction that some have to a scary movie. It's a reality in response. It's a response in, re, in light of God who he is. Respect, admiration, service. It's a reality of who God is, and we are called to respond with respect and fear. But I'd also suggest... That if you're going to be scared of something and have goosebumps at something, it probably shouldn't be scary movers or spiders, but it ought to be the reality of standing before God and receiving the punishment for your own sin and rejecting what you're hearing today, which is that there is a substitute in your place, Jesus Christ, that you could trade in your sin for his righteousness, that you could trade in your purposelessness for his purpose for you, that you could trade in all of those bad things, receive all of those good things. I'd be a whole lot more scared of standing before God and saying, God, I didn't want to do it your way or I decided to put it off until later, and that later never came, than I would have spiders or scary movies or standing in front of people speaking or any other number of things that scare people in our culture. Be more scared of God than anything else. But ultimately here, the text calls to us for fear as in respect, honor, and serve. And those that respected and honored and served God cared more about his reputation than their own. And according to verse 2, the sun of righteousness for them rises with healing in its wings. Now, it's unclear what the son of righteousness here might represent. There's a lot of scholarly discussion on it. I, I go with the early church uh, general opinion that the son of righteousness here is a description or a title for Christ as the son of righteousness. I do so because just a couple of more pages to the right in the Gospels in Luke chapter 1, at the birth of John the Baptist, Zechariah, his father, prophesied this about the coming Christ and the coming child, John the Baptist. You, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, John the Baptist there. You will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, and here's the language that I think refers to from Christ, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. I lean that the Son of Righteousness here is Christ, this is a looking ahead to Christ. We also have, though, throughout this book of Malachi, ways in which it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas and how one like John the Baptist would enter the stage and point to Christ and God's work in our place. As opposed to punishment for the wicked, notice the healing for those that served God. They were able to delight in him like cows released from a stall. All right, boys and girls, raise your hand if you've seen a real-life cow in the last week. Not a Chick-fil-A cow, not a I ate the burger cow, okay? Boys and girls, raise your hand if in real life, not on TV, you have ever seen a cow released from its stall. Okay, some of you have seen a cow released from its stall. It's been a little while though, okay? All right, boys and girls, raise your hand if you've ever seen a dog let out of its cage after being in it for a couple of hours. All right, we got a few more hands here, okay? Parents, raise your hand if you have ever, or adults, raise your hand if you've ever seen a kid let out at Christmas break, all sugared up and ready for a two-week break. Okay, so I'm going to modernize this translation for a minute. This is the Jason authorized version, I'm being very careful here. In the original Hebrew, for our modern culture, 
They were let out, leaping like kids on a sugar high at Christmas break from school. Okay? This is a picture of excitement. It's a picture of excitement here. Like they're leaping like calves from the stall. That was something they were more familiar with. We're very familiar with kids released from school for Christmas break all on a sugar high from a big week. We're familiar a little bit with dogs and the energy that they will often blast out of their cage with running around the room four or five times. You're having to train them not to jump on people when they first come out of their stall. Like that is the energy and the goodness of God in our lives. Like as believers, we should have that same joy at Christmas and all year long that comes from trusting in and treasuring God's gift in our place. As Christians, we should be joyful people who delight in the Lord. Not dull, but delight in Him. Like calves leaping from their stalls, dogs let out of their cage, and kids let out for Christmas break. We get to verse 4. Oh, yep, verse 3, sorry, we have that. They tread upon the wicked, the righteous rule, the ashes under the soles of the feet, is what the wicked are in the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. In addition to the great delight, verse 3 is a picture of the righteous reigning. So we find that God rewards those who fear and love him and serve him, and he punishes the wicked. So boys and girls, box 3. You can divide it in half. I need two presents or two boxes in there and in your two boxes in box three your two presents in box three i want you to put lots of smiles in one all types of emojis that represent happiness and in box number two all types of emojis and faces that look sad and are crying and are angry and not happy and then i want you at the end of your drawing all of that i want you to circle which one you want to be which one do you want to have because this text calls upon us to recognize the goodness and delight of God and the punishment and the misery of those that do not delight in him. The way we receive that eternal joy is to trust Christ as our Savior now. All other ways result in the punishment that we deserve for our sin. When we get to verse 4, we have a call to remember the commands, the actions of God given to Moses, the ways of life that should mark us as we put God in first place in our life. And in the Bible, remember doesn't just mean to think about something or even to write it down. In the Bible, remembering involves a call to action. If you're taking notes in the Bible, remembering in the Bible, sorry, in the Bible, remembering involves a calling to mind and a putting into action. It's not enough to put into your brain that God deserves your first and best, not your last and leftovers. It needs to actually occur. It's not enough to put into your brain and remember up here alone that God cares about the way that you think about marriage. It's not enough for religious leaders to grow big brains that know lots of things about God because they learned about it in seminary or Bible conferences or books or anything like that, but to abuse their power instead of walking with him and leading others to do the same. It's not enough to put into your brain that God has shown you mercy and you ought to give to him entrusting that to a local church. God expects you to actually do so. We are to remember and to act. We are to use our brains and to walk with God, living for him. Boys and girls, on your final box, draw a brain and then draw a person walking. Because it is our brains that should be remembering and our lives that should be walking out the things of Scripture. When we get to verse 5 and 6, we see the promise of Elijah. A new Elijah like John the Baptist that would turn hearts within families back to each other away from their wicked rebelliousness that was exemplified in their family when their families had great strife. And the gospel can still do that today. For some, Christmas is a really hard season because you've got a lot of strife in your family. The hope for your family is in the gospel. But also for others, Particularly in other places in the world, there's great strife within their family because they have trusted in the gospel. So let's pray for those that are experiencing persecution for that. Let's pray that the church that they are hopefully able to attend and gather with other believers would become a new family for them. And let's pray for the hope 
of the gospel, to turn hearts of fathers back to children, children back to fathers, as opposed to the broken relationships in the home that characterize chapter 2, the lack of godly offspring, we have a change here when God works in lives. Today, we've all disregarded God's rules. And when people in our society call evil good and good evil, people in our society pretend or say that God isn't watching. God is still showing mercy, not immediately bringing the fiery judgment of chapter 4, verse 1, and his mercy should bring about our repentance. If you've never trusted Christ as Savior, either because you've never understood that you needed to or you've been delaying that, let today be the day that you decide I'm giving up on me, I can't fix me, I need a Savior, and I put Christ in charge of my life. The days of God waiting don't last forever. The days of silence from the end of Malachi to the first Christmas when Christ was born were about 400 years. That seems like forever to them. But Christmas was coming, and the Redeemer was coming. The hope of the nations was coming. He would provide peace for families, and peace with God was coming, but so judgment was also coming. For those that there's their earthly lives ended for all eternity, that judgment. That same thing, now we've been waiting 2,400 years for that judgment, that final cataclysmic day of the Lord, when life as everyone knows it now ceases, and we enter into a new timeline for all eternity, but with the righteous rewarded and the unrighteous or the wicked who are stuck in sin not trusting in Christ as Savior, punished eternally. It looked like the day of the Lord wasn't coming, but it was at any moment. And on that silent night, Christ came. It's been 2,000 years since Christ, but the final cataclysmic day of the Lord is still going to happen. Christmas interrupted the silence when Christ was born, and the final day of the Lord will interrupt and shock people as well as we read the pages of the New Testament. So now is the time to be ready, to walk with God now. But maybe you've trusted him as Savior, but you've been wavering in your faith. Maybe you've been using all the right language about God. Maybe you've been remembering up here, but Malachi is a caution for us all, a caution for us about going through the religious motions. And the question that I want to leave us with is whether or not you're going through religious motions or are you worshipfully, delightfully obeying, remembering up here and living it out. In Luke chapter 6, verse 46, Jesus warns those that called him Lord, Lord, using the right terms for him, but not actually obeying him, going through the motions. Don't use Christian language alone. Delight in him and walk with God. In Matthew 28, 20, the Great Commission doesn't say, go and teach people to know what God wants. It says, teach them to obey all God has commanded. Religious language and going through the motion is not what God has called us to. Malachi by ends by telling us that God rewards those that diligently seek him, and that he punishes those that reject his rightful rule and reign in his place. Malachi chapter 3 and 4 are a call for us to encourage one another in the things of the Lord, to find our delight in God now, to trust that what God has said is true, that he is worth living for and following. In this last song of invitation, let's sing aloud as a way to encourage one another, to speak to one another the truths about God through song, that we might be encouraged together to celebrate Christ, his work in our place, And if you want to talk or pray about anything in particular, I'll be available during this final song of invitation in the back. Let's rise now, stand, and sing.